It's time to get your music radio ready with the Audio Skills Podcast. It doesn't matter what type of music you're creating or what gear you use. It's all about the technique. Get ready to turn your home studio into a place where your music goes platinum. Now give it up for your host, Scott Hawksworth. Hey, what's up, everybody? Scott back with you for this week's edition of the Audio Skills Podcast. I'm really excited about the show we've put together for you this week. We're going to be talking all about microphones and microphone technique, which is just absolutely critical, obviously, to getting great results from a home studio. And to help us do this, I'll be joined by Matt McGlynn, who is a home studio owner, microphone collector, and he runs the best microphone database on the web. But before jumping into all that, I wanted to bring you this week's tip. And every week, I try to give podcast listeners a key takeaway, much like I do on our tutorial videos on audioskills.com or our YouTube channel and in every article I write. So for this week, since we're talking about mics, I wanted to discuss common problems people face when recording a vocal specifically and how to address those problems. You know, unfortunately, a lot of people think that they have gear problems when their recordings aren't sounding as good as they want them to. But often, it's a technique issue. So real quick, I'm going to cover four of the most common recording problems that can really ruin a vocal and how to address them. So number one, popping or plosives. These are those blasts of air that occur when you make P or B sounds. And how to fix this issue is simple. You can either record off axis or at a slight angle, or at the very least, make sure you get a pop filter for your mic. They are super cheap, but you can even use like a bent up coat hanger and some nylon to really MacGyver one together if you don't want to buy one. This will help reduce this issue. Number two, sibilance. Those S sounds and annoying hiss. Of course, you can always use de or other tools when mixing to address those issues. But again, when recording, if you want to try to address some of that from the very beginning, using an off-axis angle when you're recording with your microphone so that the singer isn't singing directly into the mic can reduce the issue significantly. Number three. The proximity effect. Now, we discussed this at length a few episodes ago, but as a quick reminder, it's the idea that as you get closer to cardioid mics, due to their design, you'll start getting a huge low-end boost. And also, the closer you are to the mic when recording, the greater sound difference will be experienced of loudness when moving closer or further from the mic. And this can create various issues when recording. And the three ways to address it are, one... Use a pop filter again. This will naturally prevent the singer, even if it's yourself, from getting too close to the mic because you have a pop filter right there. Number two, use omnidirectional mics. Due to their design, the proximity effect is just not a problem with them. And number three, simply be aware of the effect and use it to your advantage if needed, if you want, you know, some lower frequency response in the mic to really kind of beef up a vocal and address it if it's causing issues and, you know, have the singer or the artist back off a little bit. Number four, poor room acoustics. Bottom line, if you have the best mic in the world in a crummy sounding room, the recording will sound crummy. Address this by treating your space, finding creative solutions when recording vocals, such as recording in a closet, using a vocal isolation shield, and using blankets and pillows and all these kinds of things. You can address poor room acoustics that way, but just be aware of it. So that is your audio tip of the week. So shifting gears, I am so happy to introduce our guest for this week, Matt McGlynn. He's a drummer, home studio owner, microphone collector, and he built the site recordinghacks.com as well, which is just an incredible site all about microphones. So in a discussion about microphones, you'd be pretty hard pressed to find someone better to interview. So Matt, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate you having me on. Sure. How are things going for you lately? Keeping busy? I know you said you were working on some R&D stuff and, and you've got a lot of projects going on. Yeah. My time is spread a little thin for the folks who don't know. So yeah, I started a website called Recording Hacks and that was kind of the beginning of what's turned into a fairly obsessive career all around microphones. And I guess I've always been a 
a bit of a hot rodder at heart. And so out of Recording Hacks came the idea of upgrading and modifying inexpensive microphones. So that turned into a company called Microphone Parts. And out of that came a second company because unfortunately not everybody likes to solder their microphones together before they use them. So we have a second company now uh, <laughs> called Roswell Pro Audio that makes finished microphones. And it's odd to have to characterize a product as being finished. But when your first company makes empty circuit boards and bags of parts, then that's the natural contrast, I suppose. So anyway, yeah, two different companies. We do a lot of R&D capsule testing and tuning and microphone circuit tweaking and design and shooting out transformers and capacitors. And it's kind of never ending. We've got about six or seven products in the pipeline right now and a trade show coming up at the end of the summer. So yeah, lots going on. Wow, that's amazing. Now, kind of to speak to that, can you just tell us, like, how do you get into that? You know, how, what was your, I guess, experience in audio? And then you obviously started recording hacks and all this, but, you know, how did you get your start? Yeah, I don't know if this is inspiring or embarrassing, but I knew nothing. I knew absolutely nothing. I was a drummer and home recording enthusiast. I had no gear. And the downside of being a drummer who wants to record himself is that you need a lot of gear. And so I started buying microphones mm -hmm. and started buying interfaces and all kinds of equipment. And I just realized, well, I was fascinated by it all, but I also realized I didn't really know anything. And I, I was really disappointed with the microphone shopping experience because in those days, the only place you could go for advice, short of calling a sales guy, and of course, you can't really take any salesman at, at his word because he's got clearly a vested interest in... He's selling. Yeah. And it's, it's fine. I don't have any, any objection to that. But at the same time, if... The sure. microphone that I need isn't made anymore or isn't sold by that guy, then I'm not going to get a useful answer. So, and that's where recording hacks came from was I thought I'd love to have a database where I could type in, you know, small diaphragm condenser and see a list of all of them. Because even if they're not made anymore, you can buy them on eBay, for example. And I waited mm -hmm. for two years and, and I kept needing the universe to provide this for me and it never did. And so I realized, okay, that's the sign. I just need to build it myself. And I had a background in database design, software engineering. And so I built that and I, I worked that project full time for about five years and turned it into this sort of Wikipedia for microphones is kind of how I think about it. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's a, an expression that the best way to learn something is to try to teach it to somebody else because it really underscores the gaps in your knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that's what Recording Hacks was for me because I knew a little and in the process of trying to document microphones for everybody else, I learned a lot and did my best to capture that and put it out there for other people to see. That's awesome. It's always amazing to me how in audio, folks just find different paths to wherever they're going to end up. So that's really great. So my next question is, you know, a lot of people who are just starting out in audio are pretty desperate for microphone recommendations, you know, especially the beginners out there. They're like, oh, my gosh, there's so much, you know, what, where do I start? Is there a mic or, or mics that you would recommend for any beginner to start with? And why would you recommend that mic? Yeah, so that's a tough question. Microphones mm -hmm. are, I mean, there's a, there's a ton of choices. And you know, some are better suited as an all-purpose mic than others. And the challenge that I have and I have always had with microphones is that the ones that are lower cost tend to be voiced in a way that I find really unappealing. And so if you've spent any time buying microphones or using them, you've probably come across the idea of something called the Chinese mic syndrome or the sound of a, of a Chinese microphone. And mm. What that typically means is it's just too bright. So if you were to do an acoustic sweep test on it, you'd see this big spike at 8 to 12 kilohertz. And no one needs a microphone that's plus, you know, 8 decibels at 10K. It's just, it's like a, an ice pick in your ear. It's it's harsh and it's grating. And right. when you first plug it in and you strum your guitar, you think, oh my God, that's so brilliant and detailed. And about five minutes later, you say, you know, I'm going to turn it down because it hurts to listen to. So that's the conundrum of... Mm -hmm the guy who's starting out because so many of the microphones that are affordable sound like that. So, and that is one of the reasons that I got into the DIY thing, because I realized I couldn't afford the microphones that I wanted to use. And the bummer about that is that there's, you know, it's, it's the same in audio as it is in automobiles. You know, the big factor in the cost of a brand new Ferrari is that emblem at the front of the car. <laughs> so there's a lot of value in the name. Yeah. And that's true in pro audio as well, because it's difficult to spend $1,000 to build a microphone. 
but there's a lot of microphones that sell for five to $15,000. Okay. So now there are, right. I mean, you can spend a ton of money, true, when you get into very refined components and days and days of QC and tight specifications and so on, but that's all out of reach for the guy who's starting out. Nonetheless, if you are willing to build your own gear, it's possible to build something that is fairly amazing. So I'll throw out one idea. We make a kit called the S25 and it sells for 199 We don't really make much money on that at all. We really built it for students, but we have lists of reviews from customers who are blown away by it. The nice thing about it is it's got a very neutral frequency response, which Mm -hmm. is good because nothing pokes out at you. So when you record a couple of tracks with it, you're not having this massive buildup at a certain frequency range. You know, I think of that as like a five or $600 microphone that you can buy in kit form for $199. And, you know, again, if you wanted to buy a commercial mic that approached that level of quality, you'd spend $500 or more. Now, what I just said, I I was a salesman right there, right? This is not a neutral recommendation. That's a product (laughs) that we make. So just to be transparent about that, if you don't want to go that way, then I would say go to Guitar Center and spend $100 on something and it'll be useful for some sources. It'll be too bright on some sources, but you'll learn what you like and what you don't like. I mean, to to be perfectly honest... If I knew of a of a two hundred dollar microphone that you could buy that was just great, I'd recommend it. Actually, I just thought of one. This is an old favorite of mine. It's a little boxy sometimes, but it's from CAD. Mm-hmm. It's called the M one seven nine. I don't know if they still make it, but I believe they do. And it used to be right around that two hundred dollar price point. I've lost track of that, but look it up. It's the CAD M one seven nine. It's got a pad on it, so you can record loud sources. It's got a variable pattern control, which is pretty unheard of at that price point. And it sounds good on a lot of sources. Yeah. I've, I've heard people use it as their go-to mic on toms. I think it's overkill for that. It's also a little big for that. But I've heard it on drum overheads. It sounded great. I've heard it on an acoustic guitar. It sounds good most of the time, a little boxy sometimes. But if you want to go that way, that's a pretty solid choice. I mean, that's something that you'd probably use for a couple of years. You, it's not something you'd outgrow in six months. Right on. No, I think that's really good advice. There may not be a perfect microphone at those kinds of price points, but getting out there and, and yeah, like you've mentioned, spending a hundred bucks or something and finding out what you like and what you don't and what works for you, that's usually a great place to start. So moving on in terms of microphones, there is a lot of discussion and I would say debate around USB mics versus XLR mics for recording purposes. And with, you know, some people thinking, you know, a, a USB mic is just simply no good and it's just never going to be what you can get with an XLR. And, it, you know, I, I'm curious what your thoughts are on using a USB microphone for recording, because I, I know a lot of people are doing that, especially when they start out. Yeah, it's a good question. It's hard to beat a USB mic for convenience. My mom, for example, years ago asked me, she wanted to make some self-hypnosis tapes for her counseling practice. And I thought, a USB mic would be mm-hmm. perfect for that because she's not going to be interested in learning how to drive a, a USB interface, for example, that's separate from the microphone. Plug and play makes great sense for something like that. The thing that I would watch out for, especially for a serious recordist, is that many USB mics are 16-bit devices, and I, I wouldn't want to go there. W- with a 16-bit conversion, the noise floor is pretty high, and the headroom is somewhat limited. You can get a 24-bit USB mic, I think that might be okay. I think for me, the bigger drawback is not that it's USB so much as the people making those microphones are compromising the quality and the performance to hit a price point because there aren't any commercial studios who are going to be shopping for USB mic. So that device kind of by definition is a consumer grade device. And so they're going to be mass produced. They're going to be made with surface mount electronics. The whole performance of that signal chain is just compromised. So it's fine for if you want something convenient, if you want that convenience of plug and play, it's fine. I would not recommend a USB mic for serious recording, though. Yeah, no, I I, I think that's where it it comes. And then there's a limit on the customization and and your ability to kind of control parts of things with USB mics versus XLR, which I know a lot of people don't particularly care for. So do you have any advice for someone who is wanting to evaluate a microphone for purchase. You know, obviously there's budget and that's like the big thing there, but what sorts of questions outside of just, hey, can I afford this? Are things you might consider 
before getting a new microphone? If you were walking into this guitar center or somewhere, you know, what kind of questions would you ask? That's a good question because the kinds of questions I would ask, so this sounds pretentious and I don't mean it to, but the kinds of questions I would ask, the sales guy wouldn't be able to answer. (laughs) Again, I don't mean that to sound pretentious, but I think here's a, a better answer. I would say if I could change the world around audio, it would have something to do with people should use their ears. And that happens so little. It's very frustrating. People buy based on visual appearance, advertising, and brand name and reputation. And and that's mm-hmm. very, very frustrating because for a newer company, it's hard to break through that wall of, of noise and reputation and say, hey, I've got a product that's worth considering, even though you've never heard of it. And, and a lot of people just dismiss it because they say, well, I've never heard of it, so it must not be good. I mean, that's a natural reaction. So what I tell people when they, when right. they ask about products mine or anyone else's. And I I get, you know, what should I buy questions via email every day? Not just about Mm -hmm. my own products, but someone will say, hey, I want a TLM 103. What do you think? You know, and that's a a Neumann microphone that costs a thousand bucks. What I tell everybody is go listen to it because you might be surprised. And I know a lot of these brands have amazing reputations, but the truth is until you hear your own voice or your own guitar through it in your own room, you don't know what it's going to sound like. And it doesn't much matter what the magazine ad says, okay? Because the guys who are in those right. magazine ads have million-dollar rooms and you know multi-thousand-dollar signal chains, and they have amazing artists. Whereas the average microphone buyer is working out of a, an untreated bedroom on not the world's best gear. It's just the reality of right. it. So what I one of my suggestions to people is to go. Especially if, you, if you're looking at buying a $1,000 microphone or something like that, you know, don't shop based on the logo. And that's blasphemy, I know. But spend 100 bucks, <laughs> go to the local recording studio with the best mic locker. 100 bucks will get you a couple hours of the engineer's time and access to their ISO booth. And go in there with your voice and your guitar and record 15 seconds of each of their 10 best microphones. And then take the tracks home and listen to them. And you'll be shocked because you'll actually understand then how is this mic different from that? Is the U87 worth its reputation as the most lusted for microphone in the world? You know, so listen to them on your own voice and see what you think. That's, that's the best thing you can do. Wow. I love that. And if you think about it, you know, especially if you're talking about, you know, a thousand dollar mic, like what's the hundred dollars to go in and make sure that you're getting something that is really going to work for you and you're really going to enjoy. Right. Yeah. Because the alternative, there's a very good chance that you buy something that you don't like and then what? You know, what's the resale on that U87? You're going to lose hundreds of dollars on that. So you might as well, you know, spend a little insurance up front and make sure it's the one you want. Mm -hmm. Now that makes a ton of sense. We were kind of touching on this before, but I wanted to kind of circle back to it. There are a lot of folks that say, you know, if you are trying to capture a quality vocal, you just, you need to have a top of the line mic and, and that that is just far and away the biggest difference, which, you know, for some people that can be like a bummer if you're like looking at your bank account and you're like, well, I don't have a thousand plus to spend on this vocal mic. And I think you probably already answered it in a way, but can you capture a great vocal with a more budget conscious microphone? Or is it just, you know, hey, if you want better quality, you just kind of have to spend? Well, the good news there is the answer is probably no, you don't have to spend a ton of money. I think one of the trends that really benefits consumers that's, and this has been true over the past 10 years, is that the quote unquote low end microphones or low cost microphones have just gotten better and better. And so if you go mm-hmm. out today, I'll throw out an example, Rode makes a microphone called the NT1. That mic's been around for like 15 years, but it's yep. actually three different microphones, right? There was the NT1, then the 1A, and then it's the NT1 again. And they sound very different. And the newer one sounds to my ear better. I think that microphone has really improved. They've dropped the noise floor. They've made it more neutrally voiced. The first one was super, super bright. So anyway, I think the lower cost mics have gotten better. But I think what the home recording people should do that they don't do often enough, in my opinion, based on some things that I've heard, is, I mean, it's common to lust after the multi-thousand dollar microphone, but what people also need to do is treat their recording space. So if you're recording in Mm -hmm. an echoey room, then that $18,000 vintage U47 is going to sound terrible because it's hearing all these Mm -hmm. echoes from the room. It's awful. So the best thing you can do for any microphone at a much lower cost than a really good microphone is to treat your space somehow. Now, if that means hanging blankets over microphone stands, great. That's a start. If you want to record in your closet where, you know, two walls are covered with clothes, that's 
better if you want to record in your car. I had this it's kind of a clickbaity article I put up on Recording Hacks years ago, and it was something like The Secret Vocal Booth You Already Own or some stupid title like that. But the idea was you can record in your car because it's a very well-treated space, right? There's upholstery over like 60% of it. There's no parallel surfaces anywhere, and it's shock-mounted from the floor. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so so you could take your laptop and a little bus powered USB thing and a interface and a microphone into your car and it's going to sound better than if you did it in your bedroom. So mm-hmm. I mean I know it's dumb. And yeah, you maybe can't fit your guitar in the front seat and you can't stand up to sing whatever. I get it, but the point is treat your space because that has as much to do with the quality of the output as the microphone that you use. Absolutely. That makes a ton of sense. Yeah, I think too often maybe people think that, well, all I need to do is just spend money and get this microphone and that's going to solve everything. And it's like, well, you've got to think about other things. And something else (laughs) worth considering is now people may differ on this, but this has been my experience. The closer you are to the sound source, the bigger the sonic difference is. So let me take that apart. So what's your signal chain? You've got your microphone, cable, you've got your preamp, your converter, maybe you've got some outboard gear. And so I get this question periodically, you know, should I upgrade the microphone or should I upgrade the preamp? The answer is clearly the microphone. Mm -hmm. The preamp might make a a couple of percent difference in the sound of your recorded track, but the microphone is going to make a significant difference in the sound of the recorded track. So it's been my experience, the closer you Mm -hmm. get to the sound source, which in this case would be, you know, your mouth, the bigger difference it's going to make. That's a good piece of advice there for sure. So I think this kind of ties in a little bit when it comes to, you know, we're talking about sound sources and things like that. When it comes to microphone placement, There are obviously lots of techniques out there. If you could give someone only one tip for getting the best results about where they're placing their microphones and how they're setting things up, what tip would that be? (laughs) It's the one I already gave, which is use your ears. It's stupid, but it's true. So what you'll find, what many people will find is that if you point the microphone at your mouth from directly in front of your mouth, you're going to get a lot of plosives, a lot of wind noise. Yeah. And that's probably not your best sound. Often you'll get better results if, right. you, if you move the microphone off axis. And what, it, what, so what does off axis mean? It means out of the blast radius of your mouth. So that means off to one side or down below mm-hmm. or up above. I've heard a number of voiceover producers swear by the idea of putting the microphone at forehead height pointing down. So the, the front of the mic is up the top of your nose, the bridge of your nose pointing down towards your mouth. And one of the benefits of that is that it captures chest resonance because your chest is then sort of in the Mm. line of fire or on axis of the microphone. But also your exhalations are going past the microphone, not into it. So that helps reduce the plosive sound. Now, so what works works better for you, you know, off to one side or up above or down below or six inches away or 12 inches away? Well, that depends on your voice, your microphone, your room, and what kind of sound you're going for. You know, if you want that super intimate sound, then you get up close. If your room sounds okay and you want to get a little more space so you're not you don't feel like you're licking somebody's ear when you listen to it, then then back the mic up. But again, you need better treatment for that because of the inverse square law. You know, you need the further away the microphone is from the sound source, the more of the room and the space it's going to hear. So there is no mm-hmm. one best placement, right? There's no one best microphone. There's no one best anything. It depends on, mm-hmm. again, the, the voice or the or the instrument, the room, the needs of the production. And so you need to try a couple of things and just budget for that, you know? You know, why spend all afternoon tracking and then you finally go back and listen and you think that sounds terrible because I keep hearing, you know, sibilance or plosives or mouth sounds or, or gurgling, whatever, right? Just test it first and then spend your time on tracking. Mm -hmm. Now that makes a ton of sense. And it kind of ties into something I'm often sharing with people is the idea of, you know, try a couple positions out and then listen to what result you get. And then go with the one that you like better, you know, and and you can do more than a couple. But the idea is it really does tie into what you were saying is just use your ears and and really listen to what your positions are and how everything's sounding there. Yeah, it's good advice. So I was looking on, you know, recording hacks and you, you have these microphone shootouts, which are really interesting. Do you have any advice for people who, you know, they have a number of mics, they've built out their locker a bit, and they're trying to decide on the best one for the job. What do you listen for specifically when you're like evaluating mics and, and beyond just, you know, oh, this one sounds better to me. Like what's kind of your process there? If you were to do a shootout, is there any advice you would have? Well, you sort of disqualified my answer. <laughs> it, really, it is all about, does it sound better? The fact that it's subjective explains why there's 
2,000 microphones on the market and a million ways to use them, right? Mm -hmm. There is no one best. So you might have a microphone that's amazing on guitar and strings and whatever, and you put it on a floor tom and you try it out and it's massively overloading the low end of your track. And you think, okay, well, that's, that's a great violin mic, but it's not working on floor tom. Fine. So try something else. Right. So it's, it really is all about how does it sound? But here's the difference between what we did and the real world. So we were doing a shootout and that was all about, well, in a vacuum, which one sounds better? Meaning entirely up to me, or if I had a guest writer or producer or whatever, what sounds better to him? But it's all listening in a vacuum. Like, you know, we're not using this track in a song. Now, if you were right. recording a, a piano part for a, a pop vocal track, what a lot of producers say is that they roll all the lows off and they just want this really plinky high end. And in isolation, it sounds terrible. But in the context of the track, that's what you need. Okay. We're back to the question of, does it sound good? Now, if you solo that track and you think, oh man, it's all bright and pingy, it sounds terrible. So let's put some, you know, move the mics closer to get proximity or let's put some ribbons on that piano. And then it sounds great in isolation. And then you get into the mix and you're like, oh my God, that piano sounds terrible because it's all thick and muddy. And I needed this, I needed it to cut. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, the point is, what's your context? Because that's, that's where the microphone has to sound good. And the thing is, again, too many people, probably none of your listeners, who I'm sure are smarter and better looking than the average microphone buyer, but too many people, <laughs> I would hope they make these decisions based on reputation. Well, this is an XYZ brand. And my God, there was a big feature about them in the, in the new tape op. So this must be the best mic. And I know it's not, it doesn't sound quite right to me, but you know, I don't really trust my ears, but I trust their advertising. So I'll just use it. Well, that's a terrible idea because you're the mm -hmm. producer, or if you're not the producer, pull him over and say, which one of these should we use? I mean, it's, if it sounds good, it is good. That's the end of it. That's the, the beginning and the end of it. No, oh, that's a really, really good point. So for the benefit of folks who may be newer to all this, or perhaps they're, you know, wanting to build out their mic collection and they, they just don't know where to start. Can you briefly explain the differences between dynamic ribbon and condenser mics? Because I think a lot of people get overwhelmed. They're like, oh my gosh, there's so many. Yeah, absolutely. So super, super briefly, how do they work? And, and that's probably not the most interesting question for your listeners, but I'll get into applications in a second. Condenser microphones use a microphone capsule that's a, a very thin piece of film suspended in front of a backplate, a metal plate. As sound waves hit it, the piece of plastic vibrates and that changes capacitance, which is turned into output voltage. But it needs power, right? So you have to have phantom power, which in some applications mm -hmm. is hard if you're out in the field. It's sometimes harder to have phantom power that you can carry around. Not impossible, but harder with, mm -hmm. with a battery-powered rig. A dynamic mic is like a speaker, right? It's got a moving piece as well, but it's got a wire wrapped around it and there's this kind of magnetic field. And I'm not an expert on dynamic mics, but it's a fundamentally different principle and they don't need phantom power. And then ribbon mics are mm -hmm. a third design altogether where there's this, a very, very thin piece of aluminum. It doesn't have to be aluminum, but practically speaking is typically aluminum. A very thin piece of corrugated aluminum suspended between magnets. And as that piece of aluminum vibrates, creates a field that can be detected and then you run it through a step-up transformer and that gives you your audio signal. Ribbons do not need phantom power either, although some have built-in amplifiers that require phantom power. Mm -hmm. Now, practically speaking, what does all of this mean? Condenser mics are typically the, the most popular kind of microphone and they're good for almost everything. You can use them on very loud instruments. They're great on very quiet instruments because they tend to have a lot higher output than dynamic mics, but they're a little more fragile. Mm -hmm. So stage microphones like the SM57, SM58, Audix makes a bunch of uh, dynamics. Hell, everybody does because stage artists use dynamics almost exclusively. Of course, you could use anything on stage, but typically when you see a bunch of vocal mics on stands in the front of a band, those are all dynamics. Why is that? Number one, they're very, very rugged. You can literally pound nails with them and they'll still work. I've seen pictures of an SM58 that was you know, dunked in water and they shake it <laughs> off and go sing a show. So they're impervious to almost everything, especially Shure branded mics. Shure has the most insanely rigorous torture test for microphones. I've actually toured their plant. I'll take a quick aside here. They pull microphones out of the production line arbitrarily and then like put them through a dishwasher cycle <laughs> as a test. Are you serious? They have a, it's not literally a dishwasher, but they have like a salt water booth and they, they, yeah. have, this, they have this little robot thing that that wiggles earphone earbud cables like a million times. 
It's insane. There was, a, I think Wired Magazine had a piece on that. But anyway, yeah, sure, dynamics are, sure, everything. They're just rugged as can be bulletproof. Anyway, so dynamic mics are great for stage because they're rugged. They're great for loud sources. They take mm-hmm. high SPL, high sound pressure level sources like kick drums, snare drums. They take that really well. In contrast, a condenser mic would have to be padded internally or it would overload. And then ribbon mics mm-hmm. are, they tend to be fragile. If you blast air at them, that ribbon will snap in two and kill the mic. But so they tend to be more fragile. They have a distinctive sound. They take EQ really well, which is less true of condensers. Mm-hmm. But they're also darker. Just in general, they have a very natural fading frequency response in the top couple octaves. So they tend to sound thicker. They tend to have a lot of proximity effect. So if you get close to it, the bottom end thickens up almost unbearably in some cases. So some ribbon mics are just mm-hmm. happier if you're a foot away, which feels like a lot when you're recording. But they have a very natural sort of sound to them, especially in contrast to a lower cost condenser. Because as I was saying before, inexpensive condenser mics tend to be very brightly voiced. So if you put one of those up against a ribbon mic, it is night and day. The difference is immediately apparent. So where can they be used? You know, snare drum, kick drum, toms, I'd always reach for a dynamic. Number one, they take high, high sound pressure levels better. They take errant stick hits better, right? You wouldn't want to thwack your U87 with a drumstick. Right, so yeah. dynamics are great for that. They're great for brass, which is like a trumpet is probably the loudest thing you'd ever record in a studio. Dynamics are often used on guitar cab, but they don't need to be. Ribbons are great on guitar cab. Condensers can be great on guitar cab as well. There's really a lot of options there. Some people love ribbons on guitar cab. The, the Cascade Fathead is a very popular choice. It's got a lot of mid-range presence to it, which is where guitars speak, you know, for mm-hmm. 4K. There's a lot happening on electric guitars in that sort of 4 to 6K band. Some people love ribbons on drum overheads. If the drummer's got really splashy cymbals and hits them hard, then ribbons are great for... It's like having a fader for cymbal sound. You just turn that down like 10 decibels. A well-stocked mic locker should have examples of all of these. There aren't really any hard and fast rules. I mean, there are. there's a company called MyLab that makes a $1,000 condenser for bass drum. I don't know anyone who can afford a $1,000 kick drum mic, but I've heard guys whose ears I trust say it's amazing. So, you know, great. If you've got the cash for a $1,000 kick drum mic, go for it. So there's no rules about what you can and can't do. It's all about what sounds good. But I would encourage people to experiment because, I mean, I remember I got an email, hopefully an uncommon sort of situation, but this guy said, here's my mic locker. And he listed basically 12 different microphones from MXL, which is a very popular brand. They're low cost. They have lots of color options, greens and golds and blues and reds, but they all sound really similar because all their condensers share one or two capsule designs and one or two different circuits. And so all those microphones Mm -hmm. are basically the same thing. There are exceptions, of course, (laughs) but all the ones he listed, I was like, yeah, that's, you know, that's mic A, mic A, mic A, mic B, mic A, mic B. He had like two different microphones out of (laughs) eight. And he said, I'm looking for some, something to contrast with these. And I was like, well, hell, you could pick almost anything. It's going to, you know, it's going to be different because all those mics are the same. So a well-equipped mic locker has a lot of choices. So yeah, you know, get a ribbon, get some dynamics, try them out. Electro Voice makes some really wonderful dynamic mics. And in fact, they just redesigned them. Two years ago, I saw them at NAMM. It was the ND468 is this little egg-shaped dynamic mic with a yoke mount. I didn't mean to make that in a pun because it it does look like an egg and it does have a yoke mount, but (laughs) it's amazing on snare. It's great on toms and the way you can rotate the head so it's easy to position sort of next to the drum, but peeking over the top. Their ND868 Mm -hmm. is my favorite on kick drum. So those are really fun mics. What was it called? The RE320? So the RE20 is Electro Voice's classic broadcast dynamic mic. It's the NPR sound. It's a great sound, but it's too expensive. Ah, okay, yeah. And I, I had a, a thing on Recording Hex years ago called the Ultimate Podcasting Mic Shootout, and I got all the great broadcast mics from history and did a blind shootout. So if you're interested in you know pod, podcasting or voice recording, that's worth checking out because it's got audio samples that you can listen to without knowing what they are and then see. Anyway, Electro Voice came out with something called the RE320, which was kind of a, a modern take on the RE20 and it's great. It sounds amazing. It's less expensive. It's like half the price. So I, I love a good dynamic. I'm using a Bayer Dynamic M99 right now. That was what I thought won that particular shootout. But I ended up buying the RE22 because it's such a classic sound. I just leaned towards this one. Mm-hmm. It seemed to mate to my voice better. But that's, that's an example of 
listen to a bunch of things, you know, borrow or rent from, from a rental agency or buy from a store that you know where they're going to give you a, a return policy, you know, get two or three of your top choices in and listen to them. And that's what I did for that. It was amazing because I got to hear all these microphones and then very clearly I was able to pick which one worked for me. And then my promise to the audience was I'll buy whichever one you pick. Then that was the RE20. So people picked the RE20 for me, but I picked the M99 for myself. I ended up buying both. Anyway, yeah. So try them out. That's the best way. Right on. Second to last question here. We mentioned this a little bit before, but there are large diaphragm condensers. There are small diaphragm condensers. There are even medium diaphragm condensers. Functionally, can you explain how these different diaphragm sized microphones get different results and why someone might want to go with a small diaphragm versus a large diaphragm, for example, when recording? Yeah, again, you know, no hard and fast rules. Yeah. By convention, large diaphragms are used for vocal mics. All of the best vocal mics in history were large diaphragm condensers. So you've got your U47, your C12, your Elam 251, all of those, you know, U87, U67, all those were large diaphragm condensers, whereas the small diaphragm mics tended to be used for instruments more. It doesn't mean you can't sing into them. It's, it's less usual. Now, I, I would never tell someone, well, you can't record a vocal because all you have are dynamics or all you have are small diaphragms or ribbons. I wouldn't say that. I would say, use what you've got and get the best out of it that you can and you'll learn something. And yeah, maybe you'll go buy something you like better and you get better results next time, but there's no excuse for just track and learning. So in terms of practical use, small diaphragm mics, I think a lot of them have faster transient response which is sometimes thought to be a good thing on instruments, but I don't feel like there's any hard and fast rules for that. So I would say use what mm -hmm. you've got. And again, stock up your locker with different choices and try them out and, and see what you think. You know, there's absolutely not a rule book that says you have to use this or you can't use that. So you just got to try it. For sure. So my last question for today is, you know, you obviously are well-versed when it comes to, you know, what companies are doing and the types of microphones and things like that. Where do you see microphone technology being in the next, say, 10 years? You know, what, what are the trends that you are seeing? So the, here's the curious thing about pro audio that is, I haven't given it a lot of thought, but I'm not sure I've seen this in too many other industries. And that is somewhere between embracing the past and refusing to let go of the past. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So the, the microphone everybody wants to have is the U47, which not even Neumann mm -hmm. has been able to make since like 19, whatever, 60 or something. I don't know when they stopped making it. But And so what are the most popular models today? Well, they're recreations of all of those. And there's a lot of companies that come out at all different price points. And they introduce a bunch of microphones and they say, well, this is our U87 and this is our U47 and this is our U67. And as a consumer, you think, really, is that the best we've got is these three models from Germany that were invented 40 years ago? Not to diss those models. Mm -hmm. they, they were beloved and used on records we all love. It seems to me that there are more companies trying to recreate the vintage classics than there are coming out with something new and innovative. Interesting. And so you think that just kind of as it goes on, that that trend is going to maintain at least until people stop buying the, the vintage classic emulators or what have you. Yeah, I don't see it changing. I mean, the new thing to come out is the Slate VMS. And that's one of two brand new emulation systems I know of. The other one being, it's Chris Townsend, Townsend Labs. I don't know what his company's called, but it's called, I think it's called the Sphere. But it's the same idea. They use DSP-based modeling, and then they couple that to a generic sounding microphone. They run it through their plugin, and now it's an RCA 44. You know, you tap that control in the UI, and now it's a U87, and now it's a U67, and now it's an M269, and right? But at its heart, what is that? That is yet another effort to recreate a vintage classic at a lower price point. <laughs> yeah. So that's right on. So, so in 10 years, why would that change? I don't know. I mean, is everyone going to suddenly not want a U47 anymore? No, I don't see that. I think they're, I think they're just going to keep on banging away at it until, you know, maybe someday someone will recreate that elusive VF14 tube that was in the U47 that we haven't been able to have for 50 years. And then we can really recreate the microphone. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> For sure. Oh, that's great stuff. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today, Matt. This was really, really informative. Great. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Always happy to talk about microphones. <laughs>
<laughs> right on. So that's going to wrap things up for our show and our discussion on microphones with Matt for this week. I want to again thank Matt for joining me. And if you'd like to learn more from him, you can check out his site, recordinghacks.com, or you can also check out microphoneparts.com. Thanks so much for listening today. And as a reminder, for links and information about today's show and our guest, please check out our show notes at audioskills.com slash podcast. Now go out there and make some great music. Ready to go even deeper with your recording, mixing, and music production? We've got all the info and techniques you need in one place so you can turn it up. Go to audioskills.com and access a huge library of video tutorials and private workshops so you make progress even faster. Come back next week for a brand new episode of the Audio Skills Podcast. Podcast.